So I'm glad you're back. It's always encouraging me to me when I have a class and people come back for the second time. At least they, you, you, you know, we didn't anger them or bore them the first time. That's for sure. So, so today I want to talk about one of the most debated, one of the most um, argued, maybe one of the most confusing aspects of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And so you talk to one group of people, they'll teach one thing, and you talk to another group of people, and they'll teach something else. And so we want to take a look at what Scripture says today and come to a balanced point of view. And so uh, uh, the topic that we're discussing today, it's in your outline, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit versus the filling of of the Holy Spirit. So, so first of all, let me just ask, are those terms that you've heard of before? Has anybody heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit before, okay? And you've heard of the filling of the Holy Spirit. So, so, so there are a lot of questions about these two topics. For example, let me give you some of the questions that are asked. Are the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit different words for the same event? Um, are there two Holy Spirit baptisms. Some, some denominations and groups would say that there are two baptisms. There's one, and then there's a secondary experience, a secondary baptism. What does it mean to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? I mean, we know what it means to be baptized in water. What does it mean to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? Do tongues always follow the baptism of the Holy Spirit? So, so there are some groups that, that, that insist that the evidence of being baptized by the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And so that then would lead someone to the question then, if I don't speak in tongues, or if I've never spoken in tongues, have I been baptized by the Holy Spirit? And so, I mean, I've even had people in our church that come up and say, Brian, man, I've never spoken in tongues before. Have I been baptized by the Holy Spirit? You know, you know that's a good question. Um, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? So if the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit are two different things, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And, and the, the last question, which, which is where I really want to go today, is this. Why am I, and, and I can only speak for my life, I can't speak for your life, but I'd venture you might say the same thing. Why am I living and ministering at times with so little of the Holy Spirit's power? So, so if, if I have the omnipotent Holy Spirit of God living within me, why do I struggle? And why do I not experience more of his power in my life? So, so those are great questions, and, and I hope that we can address all of those questions today, all right? And so, um, as I mentioned, those are, those are great questions, and they're all worthy of a biblical response. So, so let me just kind of lay it out <coughs> this way. So there's generally two camps in all of this. And so <coughs> you might be here today and come from, from either one of those camps. So there's generally what we would call the evangelical conservative camp that probably would hold to more of a biblical expression of that. And then there's the charismatic camp that would probably hold to more of an experiential expression of all of that. So, so, so I want to say from the very beginning that my, that, that my purpose tonight is not to defend one of those two points. As a matter of fact, I would say that there's validity in both. So, so, so I would say that those of us that hold to more of a conservative biblical view lack some of the experiential power that, that our charismatic friends have. And I think I, would, I could also say, and they would agree, that those who hold to the charismatic position, that experiential position, probably lack a little bit of the solid biblical foundation. So what I would love to do tonight is kind of marry both of those and come to a balanced perspective that is biblically based but is experientially strong in us experiencing the reality of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. Does that make sense tonight? And so admittedly, there's a diversity of opinions. So I spend a lot of time with pastors, a lot of time. And uh, if I put 10 of our pastors in a room from Hollywood, I'm probably going to get 10 different points of view, especially on these. And some of my best pastoral friends 
would be gentlemen that probably hold a little bit different position than I do, but I have to admit that I have learned from them. And they not only have taught me, they have challenged me. I don't know whether I've challenged them, but, but, but they have challenged me. And so, so my desire is to be extremely sensitive to the diversity of opinions, but at the same time, try to be really true to what the scripture says. Does that make sense? And so I not only want to challenge you tonight intellectually. So if, you're, if your experience with the Holy Spirit is more experiential I want to challenge you biblically tonight, all right? If your experience with the Holy Spirit is more intellectual, I want to challenge you experientially tonight. So, so, so really, wherever you are on this, I want you and I to walk away challenged tonight because I have been, and this is a learning process for me, all right? So, so as we begin talking about the baptism versus the filling, I want to begin probably where you wouldn't expect to begin. I want to begin in the Old Testament. And I don't want to begin in the New Testament. I want to begin in the Old Testament. And I want to begin with the question, because it's, and we'll tie it all together in a second. How did the Holy Spirit relate to Old Testament believers? And so we know in the New Testament that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, and we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But how did the Holy Spirit relate to Old Testament believers? And I want you to think. Would you be willing to put your thinking caps on with me tonight? All right, and let's just think through things. So life, in, life for Old Testament believers was very different than it is for those of us who would consider ourselves New Testament believers. It not only was more different, but I would say it was more difficult for them. So I want you to think through me. So I want a little bit of interaction here. So, so why was it, let's just say it this way, why do you think it was more difficult to live um, like a follower of Yahweh, let's say it that way in the Old Testament, to be faithful to the Old Testament commands, to the Ten Commandments, to follow the law? Why was it more difficult to be faithful in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament or in our day and age. Does anybody have an idea for that? Rum? Because of what? Because of, of all the laws. So, 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 so they had to fulfill, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, why else? Uh huh. They, they, they did. I do believe that they could pray, and I do believe they did have access to God. Obviously, the sacrificial system, you, you know, was a, was a hindrance, and so that's what you mean. I, I think with all of that, Jesus, we have direct access right in to the Father. He's kind of tore the veil and all of that kind of stuff, so you're right. Why else would you say? Mm-hmm. A lot of sinful stuff going on, kind of like today. <laughs> there was I mean you read I mean good grief Moses was up on the up on Mount Sinai and the children of Israel were down there below and they not only built a calf but they were involved in some type of sinful activity and so there was a lot of fleshly sinful activity going on illiteracy yeah maybe so I've never thought about that maybe so yeah I would even say but along those lines I think you're following a point right there David what were you going to say Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to stop you because you're teaching my lesson right now. And, and, and I don't want you to get too far ahead of me right there, David. All right, you're, 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 you're taking away all of my thunder right there, so I don't want to do that. No. You're 100% right. So, 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 so I mentioned three things, okay? And, and, and the, one, the one you didn't mention, I think Patricia was close to it, but remember, 
they didn't have completed scriptures like we have today. So, so today, you and I, we take for granted. We have a whole Bible, and so we could read the whole Bible. And so they had the Pentateuch for most of the Old Testament, uh, for most of the Old Testament period. They didn't have completed scriptures. They certainly didn't have the New Testament. So we have much more knowledge about God, about what he wants for us, all of those things than the Old Testament believers did. As David mentioned, they were looking by faith forward to an event that hadn't happened yet, while we are looking back at that event already seen it as something that have occurred and we can believe in something that occurred by faith rather than trying to believe in something that has not occurred yet by faith. And the third thing David already alluded to was that the believer's relationship with the Holy Spirit was different in the Old Testament than it is today. All right, so, so that's kind of where I want to go with our first point, because the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is complex. Uh, uh, I'll admit it, all right? And so I spent a lot of time reading and studying. So there's actually five different opinions. I'm not going to bore you or confuse you with them tonight, but there's actually five different opinions as to how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. And so I don't pretend to understand it completely. There's, there's some... In, Uh, intricacies of it that I'm still working out in my mind and heart. But I do want you to see this, and this is where we are in the notes. And the first is this. The indwelling Holy Spirit is promised as a part of the new covenant. So let me just give you just just a brief Old Testament history synopsis right here, okay? You'll you'll remember that, that Israel's relationship throughout the Old Testament with God was managed through a series of what we would call covenants, all right? The first in Genesis chapter 12 was the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, God came to Abraham and he said, listen, I want you, I, I, I'm going to make of you a great nation. He pulls him out of Ur of the Chaldees and he makes that covenant with him. And that covenant basically was like nationhood. He told him, he said, listen, I'm going to make a nation of you. Chapter 15, it looks at, he tells him, looks at the stars of the heaven, count the stars. And, you know, my translation, okay, one, two, three, four. There's too many to count, and God says exactly my point. I'm going to make a nation as many as the stars of heaven. So I'm going to make a nation, and that was based upon a covenant that God made with Abraham. The next covenant was the covenant that he made with Moses. There, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, there in Exodus chapter 19, and that the Mosaic covenant wasn't just nationhood, but it was about a land. And God said, as, as, as the people of Israel, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. That's going to be yours. And that was part of that covenant. And God told them, as long as you obey my commands, and as long as you do what I tell you, you can live in the land. But you know as well as I do, what happens in the Old Testament? They're disobedient, and so what does God do? He takes them out of the land, and he sends them into bondage. And so that Mosaic covenant had to do with the land that was given to them. The third covenant was the Davidic covenant, the covenant that God made through David. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. If the Abrahamic covenant talked about God making them a nation, and if the Mosaic covenant talked about God giving them a land, the Davidic covenant, or the covenant with David, talked about God giving them a future leader. Remember, because of David's faithfulness, God said that his descendants would rule on the throne forever. And Jesus actually is a descendant of David and has assumed the Davidic throne of Israel, okay? So, so as you walk through the Old Testament, those are basically the three covenants. The problem with that is, is Israel violated their part of every single one of those covenants. So God, God was faithful in his part, but Israel was unfaithful in their part, And so as a result, they were constantly punished throughout the Old Testament. And so I say it this way, their persistent failure to live according to God's covenant requirements led to disaster for the nation and for the monarchy. It culminated in judgment, the temple was destroyed, and they were sent into Babylonian exile. All right, And the Old Testament basically ends almost with Israel having been in exile and pretty much coming out of exile, having been disobedient to all three covenants. But here's what happens. As the Old Testament starts coming to a conclusion, God promises one more covenant. 
And God promises the nation of Israel that he would give them a new covenant. All right, now we're going somewhere with this, all right? So, so if you have your Bible, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 33. I want to lay this out because it's really important as we interpret specifically the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how that happens in the book of Acts, all right? So Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verses 31 through 33. Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make, notice what he says, a new covenant with the house of Israel. So not the Abrahamic covenant, not the Mosaic covenant, not the Davidic covenant. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant with Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law with them. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. All right, so God says, man, you've blown it three times. You've blown three covenants. But I'm going to give you one more covenant. I'm going to give you a new covenant. And the new covenant, and this is all intro stuff, so I can send this to you if you want it. It's not in your notes. But, But the new covenant involved three things. It involved a permanent sacrifice who would eliminate all the Old Testament sacrifices. If you want to read about that, it's in Hebrews chapter 8. Who is the permanent sacrifice? Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes and he makes the sacrifice once forever. So all of those repetitive sacrifices that had to take place in the Old Testament don't happen to happen anymore. Why? Because Jesus died once for all time. So God says in this new covenant, I'm going to make one sacrifice that's going to be good forever. He says, secondly, I'm going to give you complete forgiveness of sins and complete acquittal. That was something that the Israelites didn't understand because every year they had to do what? They had to go into the Holy of Holies. They had to make a sacrifice for the priest. Then the priest had to make sacrifice for for the people. And any acquittal they got from God basically only lasted for 365 days and they had to do it all over again. But God says, here's what I'm going to do in my new covenant. I'm going to give you complete forgiveness of sins and complete acquittal of the guilt. And the third thing was the establishment of a new nation made up not just of Jews now, but of Gentiles. Okay? So, so you with me? So now you got to be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit? No, not in the Old Testament. Jesus is talking about the new covenant that is coming. And he's saying that new covenant will be made up not just so, Galatians chapter 3, be made up not just of Jews, but he made up Gentiles as well. All right, so what does all that have to do with the Holy Spirit? Well, as a benefit of the new relationship, that new covenant that God was going to have with his people, he says this, that he would give them the Holy Spirit in a way that they had not experienced him before. All right, so here's another passage of Scripture. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 31, verses 26 and 27. Ezekiel 30, no, you know what, I'm wrong. It's Ezekiel 36. I put 31. What's this on your notes? I put it, 36, I put it wrong in mine. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. So here God's talking about this new covenant that he's going to establish. Notice what he says. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He'll make make us moldable. And notice what he says. And I will put my spirit, where does he say? Within you. He he says, I'm going to do something that you've never experienced before. So based upon the new covenant of Jesus dying on the cross, the Old Testament sacrifices being eliminated, your sins being forgiven, you being acquitted of your guilt before God, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and obey my rules. So, sir, I kind of want to flesh that out. If you have your notes, so, so I'm with you in your notes right now, all right? So here's what I said. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit dwelt among his people, but not in them. All right, so, so, so somebody think through. So think through me. How was God present with his people in the Old Testament? Can somebody tell me? Not a trick question. 
in the tabernacle, remember? In the tabernacle and then eventually in the temple. So, so, so when they built the tabernacle and they put the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle, God made the statement. He said, there I will meet with you. And remember how they, how they did the camp? So the encampment, they always put the encampment in a circle around the tabernacle. Why? So that the presence of God was where? It was right there in the middle of the people. They could walk out of their tents and they could see the tabernacle where God was. And so in the Old Testament, God didn't dwell in them, but God dwelt among them. Okay, here's the second thing, and I'm going to kind of bounce through this, uh, but it's this. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon certain individuals with a special anointing to accomplish a specific task. So, for example, in Exodus chapter 31 and Exodus chapter 35, you find that, that as they were making the, temp, uh, the tabernacle, they were to find artisans, they were to find creative people to kind of build the different elements of the tabernacle. And God says very quickly, and my spirit, or clearly, my spirit will be upon them to do the job that I have commissioned them to do. In other words, what happened in the Old Testament was the Holy Spirit came upon individuals to perform a, a, a task but he didn't stay with them. So he was, that anointing, as it were, was on them as long as they were performing the task that God wanted them to perform. But the Holy Spirit of God did not dwell within them permanently as he does with us. Are you with me? Are you with me? The third thing I say in your notes is this. The Holy Spirit would come, and it ties right in, come upon a person for a special purpose and then leave them. Let me just give you one verse that will demonstrate what I'm talking about. So remember after David committed the sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, and his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, he's crying out to God, he says, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, and he makes this statement, cast me not from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Now why did he say that? Because he realized that because God had anointed him as the leader for that task, but that, that, that indwelling, that anointing of the Holy Spirit of God was not something that permanently resided with him. God could pull it back at any time. And David, because of the sin, says, God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So here's the fourth thing, and we'll get into the other. The last is this. Jesus, as Jesus began his ministry, he prophesied that the Holy Spirit was still to be given. All right, so what we're proving is that, that, that in the Old Testament, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, they didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit like we have. The Holy Spirit didn't operate then like he does now, all right? So here are two verses, and you might want to look them up. They're, they're really good verses. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, all right? Here's what Jesus says. On the last day of the feast... The great day Jesus stood up and cried, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Notice what it says. Now this he said about whom? About the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. Notice what it says. For as yet the Spirit had not been given to them. Why? Because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So even Jesus is talking about, he's saying, man, there's, the, there, there's a day that's going to come when out of you is going to flow rivers of living water. And what is he talking about? He's saying, he said, because you are going to get something that as of yet you don't have. You're going to get the Holy Spirit. And then John adds the commentary. He said, Jesus says this because the Holy Spirit as of yet had not been given to them. Does that make sense? And then notice we saw this verse last week, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. So here are the very words of Jesus, and Jesus says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Let me pause there for a second. Why would he make the statement that he will give it to you if they already possessed it? All right? What's he saying? 
He's saying that I'm going to ask God to give you something that as of yet you don't possess. The spirit of truth. All right, let me continue reading. And he says, because it, it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells. Notice, notice the specifics of what Jesus said. He dwells with you or he dwells among you. But then he says, but he will be what? In you. So, so, so here's what I want you to see. And this is going to lead right into where we're going. All right. The Old Testament believers had a different relationship with the Holy Spirit than you and I have today. The Holy Spirit dwelt among them. And I want to flesh that out in just a second because I think there's something really powerful for us in a practical way. All right, It wasn't that the Holy Spirit wasn't there and wasn't at work. Because they were saved the same way that we are, by faith. And somebody can only be regenerated, how? By the Holy Spirit of God. So, 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 so we believe that man is depraved, so we don't have anything of ourselves that draws us to God. The only thing that draws us to God is the Holy Spirit that's drawing us to God. And so in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was active. He was at work among them. He just wasn't living in them. But Jesus says, but there's coming a day that I'm going to establish a new covenant with you. A new covenant that's going to be ratified by the blood of Jesus. And a new covenant that will involve the Spirit of God living within you. That's something that Old Testament believers did not experience. Bianca. Mm -hmm. So, so, so what I mean by among is he would be present with them in the tabernacle or in the temple. So he wasn't with them individually as he is with us today, but he was active among them. All right? So, 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 today, so today we have, you have the Holy Spirit of God, we're going to see in a second, living within you. All right? There's no evidence that, that he lived that way among the people in the Old Testament. There's not a single verse that, that, that indicates that. He lived among them. God was there. But that's why, that's why the prophet Ezekiel is saying and Jesus is saying, but you're going to experience something that those Old Testament believers never experienced. Yeah, Patricia. Well, he came upon people. You're exactly right. He came upon them, anointing them for a particular purpose. So even as we're in the book of Judges, at times it's going to say that the Spirit of God came upon the judge. And the Spirit of God anointed or empowered that judge to do the job that he wanted them to do. But there's no evidence that he stayed with that judge. He was with that judge as long as that judge was doing the mission that God had entrusted him to do. But, but that judge wasn't permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Well, what's that? I'm sorry. Well, I mean, I can give you some. So, so, so I've given you some. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I gave you three verses there that are in your notes. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 3. Let me just read one of those. Yeah, yeah, Moses is an example. There's no doubt about that. Moses is an example. David is an example. But, it's, but it wasn't just them. It was others as well. For example, here in Exodus 31, 3, it says, and so it says, let me just read the, the beginning of the chapter. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. And so here this individual is, is called to do a job as they constructed the tabernacle. And God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to place my Holy Spirit within him to empower him to do it just the way I want him to do it. And we see that repeatedly through the Old Testament. So there's no evidence that every believer had that. But we have evidences that those who were given special tasks assigned by God were empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish that. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, 
So jump with me. So the second thing that I want you to see, and we're going to go back, we're going we're to visit this, okay? So now at salvation, all right, so, so when you and I are saved at salvation, the believer is now, to use that term, baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of of Christ, and we're going to look at verses that say that. So, 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 so let's talk for just a second about that word "baptize." All right, the word "baptize" comes from the Greek word "baptizo," which means to plunge, to dip, so to, to submerge, to put under. And it's interesting that that's the term that's used, not just for water baptism, but it's the term saying that whenever a person trusts Christ, at that moment they are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. In other words, as a believer, you are submerged into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. All right, so, so let me show you a couple of verses, all right? So in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, this is Jesus right before he ascends up into heaven. Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. All right, Jesus says this, For John baptized with water... But you will be baptized, what does he say? With the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. All right, so he's not talking about water baptism here. He's talking about being baptized by the Holy Spirit, and we'll explain what that means in just a few moments. So here's what I want you to catch and, 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 and think with me tonight. And so this might be a new concept. If I'm making you think, I'm really glad, all right, because that's good, all right? Put on your spiritual caps. But, and so, so, so Jesus said that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. And beginning in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, and then gradually through the book of Acts, all right, as individuals understood the truth of the gospel, trusted in Jesus, they received for the very first time the indwelling Spirit. And you read that throughout the book of Acts. So these people were, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? That means that for the very first time, the Holy Spirit of God indwelt them. So the idea of baptism is simply this. It's the idea that the Holy Spirit takes us and he places us in the body of Jesus Christ. So we're baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit of God. He is the one who does it. So th think with me for just a second and we'll, we'll, we'll dive back into it. But can you imagine how transformational it would have been for a believer who lived during that transitional time, who had lived part of their life believing, but never having had the Holy Spirit of God live within him or her? And all of a sudden, because of their faith in Jesus and because of Jesus' finished work on the cross and because of the new covenant that Jesus established, by faith they trust in Jesus. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit of God indwells them. A little hard for us to comprehend because we live with it. And can I just say, critical of me and, and maybe critical of you. I, I can't be critical of you because I don't know your heart. We have a tendency to take the Holy Spirit of God for granted in our lives. We live with him all the time. We don't know what it's like to not live with him. And yet we live with him. And if I can be so bold, we maybe go all day long without speaking to him or go all day long without listening to him. Or go all day long without being directed by him. We have a privilege, a unique privilege that believers for centuries didn't have. And that happens to us at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want you to catch, and this is in your notes, all right? All believers have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. So you might be sitting back today saying, okay, Brian, have I been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Every single believer who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ has been baptized by the Holy Spirit of God. You might sit back and say, I don't remember that. 
It's something that happens simultaneously. I mean, there's so many things that happen simultaneously at the moment of our conversion. We're regenerated. We're justified, declared righteous, just as if we never sinned. We're placed in the body of Christ, and we are given the Holy Spirit of God who then places us in the body of Christ. So, 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 so there's a little bit, and this is where some of our debate comes in because there's a little bit of debate saying, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a secondary experience that happens after, happens sometime later than salvation. And I want to prove to you that that's not the case, all right? So go with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And what I, and what, so, so let me just get ahead of myself here while you're looking there. I think sometimes it's a semantical difference. I think that, that our, our charismatic friends are describing an event, but they're using the wrong term to describe the event, all right? Saying that this happens later than salvation, but, 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 but not understanding exactly what the baptism is and confirming, in my humble opinion, the baptism with something else that we'll see just in a little bit. But notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, Paul says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. All right, so notice what Paul says. Look at all the words. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. All right, so, so, so here's Paul talking to the Corinthian believers and saying, we were all baptized into one body. So he says everybody there, all right, was baptized into one body. All right, so, so, so let, me, let me qualify that, and we'll put that in context for the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you know anything about 1 Corinthians, not every member of the Corinthian church was what we would call a spiritual member. Would you agree with that? So 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul looks at him and says, I wish I could call you spiritual, but I can't because you're carnal. You're, you're babies in Christ. And, and so speaking to those same people in chapter 12, he looks at him and says this, we've all been baptized into the Spirit. And, and so he's not, he, he's not saying, listen, you spiritual ones who had a secondary experience have been baptized into the Spirit. He says what? We all, Jews and Greeks, all of us who were a part of this body, we have been baptized together in the Spirit. Let me remind you what else has taken place in Corinthians, all right? If you haven't read through the book lately, we preached on it several years ago. In, in chapter 3, there's divisions within the church. Paul comes in and says, man, some of you say you're a Paul, some of you say you're a Paulus, and you're fighting with each other. Basically, he says, stop it. In chapter 5, he talks about sexual immorality in the church. In the church, he says, within the church, there's sexual immorality and you are not addressing it so bad that one of you is sleeping, I know we got some teens in here, but is having relations with his father's wife in the church. In chapter 6, talks about lawsuits between believers that are taking place. Chapter 7, he talks about improper reasons for divorce in the church. In chapter 8, he talks about the abuse of Christian liberty. And in chapter 12, he talks about misunderstanding of spiritual gifts. And so as Paul wrote the, the, this letter to the Corinthians, he writes the Corinthians not to commend the Corinthian church, but he writes the Corinthians for the purpose of what? Of correcting mistakes in the church. I'm always surprised. Uh, I was an associate pastor in Atlanta for a period of time, and there was actually a church that was named Corinth Baptist Church. And I sit back and think, did you not read the New Testament? <laughs> Why did you name yourself Corinth Baptist Church? Why? Because Corinth, the church of Corinth was a messed up church. It wasn't a spiritual church. And so if the argument is that only spiritual believers receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why does Paul look at all of the Corinthians and say, all of you, all of you have been baptized into the Holy Spirit of God? Why is that? that that's because all believers are baptized into the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit 
is the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in you, he indwells you, and he places you in the body of Christ. And quite frankly, if you haven't been baptized by the Spirit, you are not a believer. You are not in the body of Christ because all believers have been placed in his body. Just like all believers possess all of the Holy Spirit, every believer has been placed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. Here, here's the second thing in your notes, and I gotta see where my time is. All believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So Paul is saying what? Every believer has not only been baptized in the Spirit, but you've been sealed. And the, the idea of sealed has the idea of what? So, so it has the idea of what? A, uh, a guarantee. It has the idea of security. He says you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. By what? It's a mark. He says you have the mark of God on your life. And the mark of God on your life is the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in your life. He is the seal of your salvation. So if you ever sit back and wonder, oh my word, when I die, am I going to be able to, you know, Peter's, you know, the old joke, Peter's going to be there at the gate, and is he going to let me in? He's not going to let you in because he sees anything in you. Guess what he's going to see in you? He's going to see the Holy Spirit of God. He's going to see the mark of the Holy Spirit of God, and he's going to know right away that you belong because you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. All right? All believers are gifted by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about gifts next week, all right? A little bit of an interesting conversation, Patricia. It happens immediately at the moment of salvation. And so there's no, and I mean, so, so, so sometimes we can debate, so what happens first, justification or regeneration, and then, and then this happens? I just think it all happens simultaneously. In the mind of God, I am I'm redeemed. In the mind of God, whenever I respond by faith to Jesus, that moment, I'm redeemed, I'm justified, I'm regenerated. The Holy Spirit of God comes in within me, and I'm placed within the body of Christ. Yeah, exactly. Or, or a prayer, or even in the heart. So, 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 I mean, sometimes I think we whittle it down, so it's got to be the prayer. But at that moment, when faith is activated in the heart of the person, it's that faith, exactly, takes place at that moment. Takes place at that moment. Absolutely. And so all of us are gifted. So notice 1 Peter 4.10. I'm going a little quick because I really want to hit this last point. Um, uh, Peter says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So next week we're going to talk about gifting. So, so every single one of you, us here today, have been gifted by the Holy Spirit of God. Sadly, m many of us have no idea what our gifts are. And so as a result, we don't operate within our gifts and we don't operate in the power of the Holy Spirit when our gifts. And so we live an ineffective, defeated, unpowerful life. That's kind of where we're going with all of this, okay? The, the fourth one, and um, I might create a little bit of controversy here. We're going to talk about it next week. But the gift of tongues is not an evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, now next week we're going to talk about tongues and we're going to talk about all of that. But, but, but... The gift of tongues is not the evidence of the Holy Spirit, and I can show you that, all right? So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all right? So go to the bottom, the end of the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we already read verses 12 and 13 where Paul says, we all have been baptized into one body by the Holy Spirit. So we realize he's talking to this whole congregation. He says all of us have been baptized into his body. So you get down to verse 29, and Paul's making a point, and he asks a series of rhetorical questions, all right? So, so, so. So somebody tell me, what does a rhetorical question mean? Oh, the answer is understood, all right? So, so, so he doesn't even have to give the answer because the answer is just understood. So he asks a series of rhetorical questions as he come, talks about the fact we're all part of one body, everybody's important, all of that. And so he asks the question, are all apostles? Rhetorical question, what's the answer? Hmm? No, not all of us have, have the gift of apostleship, not all of us.
Exactly, exactly. So, so he's, he's actually going back and revisiting everything he had talked about. Exactly, that's what he's doing. So he says, are all apostles? No, not everybody has the gift of apostleship. Are all prophets? No, not everybody has the gift of prophecy. Are all teachers? No, not everybody has the gift of teachers. Are all, do all work miracles? Not everybody has that gift. Do all possess the gift of healing? No, not everybody possess that. Do all speak with tongues? What's the, what's the answer that he's expecting? No. So, so not everybody does. Do all interpret? No. So here's what he's saying. So, 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 so everybody has gifts, but not everybody have the same gifts. And there's not one gift that everyone possesses. And so for someone to sit down to say, as some of my friends say, to sit down and say, well, yeah, you don't speak in tongues, so you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit because the gift of tongues is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That does not jive with what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying not everybody speaks in tongues. So that is not the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What's the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? A changed life. The Holy Spirit of God indwelling us and changing us. For if anybody's in Christ, he's what? He's a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. All right, so, so follow me. So, so I want to get here. What time is it? How much longer do I got? I got seven minutes. All right, you with me? Seven minutes. So what's that? I can take as much time as I want. It doesn't mean you're going to stay, but I can take as much time as I want, right? So, so here's what I see. So, so all believers experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a one-time occurrence that happens at the moment of salvation. But catch this third point, and here's where we mess up. When I say we, I'm talking about me and other evangelical pastors. The, not the ones who lean towards the experiential side, but those of us who lean to more of a conservative, uh, biblical side. This is where we messed up. It's important that each believer be repeatedly filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So there's a difference between the baptism, which happens at the moment of salvation, which places us into the body of Christ, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So here's what I say. This is my testimony, okay? So as much as I think our charismatic brothers and sisters have misinterpreted the significance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I think we are guilty of minimizing and misinterpreting the meaning, the importance, and the necessity of the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Does that make sense? So, 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 so if it seems like I've been a little critical of our charismatic brothers and sisters, right now I'm being extremely critical of us. Because here's what I say. I think their mistake is semantical. I think their mistake is semantical in, in that they confuse at times what is the filling of the Holy Spirit that happens later with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's just a terminology issue. I think our issue is spiritual. Because we, and when I say we, it's the generic we. You might look and say, what, do you got a mouse in your pocket, Brian? But, 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 but when we do that, we have a tendency to minimize and to toss aside and to not give importance to the filling of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. Yeah, Patricia. Sure. Yeah, so, so, so let me get there. So the word filling does not mean all right, so, so and I think the, the English translation of the word sometimes lends itself to be ambiguous as if I don't have all of the Holy Spirit, so I need more of him. All right, there's no evidence in Scripture that you only receive a part of the Holy Spirit of God and then you get more of him. All right, let me dive into that. Let me, let me dive into that just a little bit, okay? All right, so, so I say this. So I want you to read Ephesians 5.18 with me. All right, Ephesians 5.18, this is probably the key verse on being filled with the Spirit. And I want to talk to you about how we have historically defined it, which, is, which isn't incorrect, but it's limited the way we've historically defined it. All right, so Ephesians 5.18, Paul says this, And don't be drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. In other words, he says, don't be controlled by something else. Don't let wine control you, but be filled 
with the Holy Spirit, all right? So, so, so just to give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of, of an original language lesson, so that's found in the present participle, all right? So the idea is not be filled as if it happened one time. The, 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 the structure of the sentence is this way, and it's be being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And so it's not just something that happens one time. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you want to go back and talk grammatically, is fine in the aorist tense, which is a once and for all action. It happens at the moment of salvation. But be being filled is in the present participle. It's talking about something that should occur repeatedly over and over and over and over again in our lives. All right? So let me flesh this out quick, and then if we have some questions, we can hit them. So I say this, historically... We, and when I talk about we, I'm talking about Brian and guys like me, my, all right, of my stripe. Historically, we have defined the filling of the Spirit as being controlled by the Spirit, which is correct, all right? And so we, we take the context of Ephesians chapter 5, in which Paul is saying, don't let wine, don't let anything else control you. You should only be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. That's an absolute true interpretation, but we limit the interpretation to that. And it's completely applicable, and it's completely um, appropriate for you and I to ask ourselves, am I being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God? All right? So, so that is the interpretation, but it's not the only interpretation. All right? So the second point I say is this. In defining the filling of the Holy Spirit as being controlled by him, we have missed out on the supernatural power available to us. Because here's what we do. We make, it, we make it this pragmatic thing of, okay, am I being controlled by him? Okay, so I'm not, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict. I'm not struggling with pornography. I'm not struggling with this. So there's nothing else controlling me. So it must be the Holy Spirit of God that's controlling me. And we make this pragmatic conclusion. We draw the conclusion not based upon the evidence in our life, but by the negative evidence in our life. So this isn't happening, this isn't happening, this isn't happening. So I must be being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And what we miss out on is the supernatural aspect of what it means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and here's what I want to say. And, and I wish I could tell you that I've figured this out. I haven't figured it out. I'm just learning it, but here's what I want you to catch. You have within you, and I have within me, the omnipotent, all-powerful creator of the universe living within me and living within you. Why then do we continue to be defeated by the same sins over and over again in our life? Why do we allow sin to overpower us when living within me and living within you is the omnipotent, all-powerful God. And why do we not live a life that experiences the supernatural on a regular basis? When I talk about supernatural, I'm not talking about the wacko that sometimes we see out there. I'm talking about experiencing the supernatural Holy Spirit of God where we see prayers answered, we see God do supernatural things in our life, and we see our lives being changed, not by our own power, but the power of the Holy Spirit of God who's living within us. And so here's what we have done. We've minimized the supernatural. We understand the historical grammatical interpretation, but we've minimized the supernatural aspect of it. Does that make sense? Are you following me? Does that make sense? All right, Paul says, or the writer, or Luke says this, Acts 1.8, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So man, I, I've, I've wrestled with this. Why do I feel powerless at times? If I'll receive power, why do I feel powerless in my life? So, 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 let me, so let me flesh this out. So the next point is this. To be filled with the Spirit means, it means to be controlled by Him, but it means to long for the experience, presence, and power in your life. It means to long, L-O-N-G, to long, to desire to desire the Holy Spirit's presence and power in your life. 
So I knew I was going to be running at the end here, right here. So I, I, the rest is already filled out in your notes, all right? So you don't have to fill anything else out. And so, so the question is, so what does that look like? So what does it look like to long, to really long for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit? I'm, I'm going to give you six things really quick, and you can look up the verses, okay? The first is this. Stop sinning. <laughs> it's that simple. All right, now, now I know we can't do it in our own power, but we have the Holy Spirit of God within us. So, so stop sinning. The, the sins that seem to control us, whether they're, they're big or whether they're little, whether they're, you know, the really bad sins or whether what we'd call the really good sins, stop sinning. Why is that? Because every sin we commit, here's what it does. It grieves the Holy Spirit of God, and it robs us of power. So what happens when you sin then? Confess your sin to God. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to do what? To forgive us of our sins. The third thing is this. Seek to live every single moment as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. First, not second, not third, not fourth. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The fourth one, we talked about this last week. I wish I could just park here, but I can't. Be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he speaks guides, directs your life. I gave you a couple of verses there. You can read them later on. So what does that mean? Here's what it means for me. And I'm just learning this. So so I'm not an expert. I'm just learning. It means to be still before him. To eliminate distractions. To listen for his inner voice. So, So I pray almost every morning. God, give me ears to hear. As as the scripture talks about, give me ears to hear. God, as you speak, help me not to allow the distractions. Help me to block out the distractions. Because you know as well as I do, somebody can be talking and we don't hear because of the distractions. Any of you have Alexa in your home? Little Alexa, we have little Alexa. You know, the, the little machine you talk to and she answers all of your questions connected to Google. I don't know how many times we'll say, Alexa, do this, and she'll write back. I'm sorry, I can't understand your question. <laughs> Why is it? Because there's, uh, there's other noise in the room. I'm speaking, but she can't understand. And, and here's the thing I want us to see. God is always speaking to us. But because of the distractions, we don't hear him. So I've got to eliminate the distractions. I have to sit silently in his presence and listen for his voice. The fifth thing is ask God to pour out your spirit, or his spirit, excuse me, on your life. Joel, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, even on the male and female servants in those days. I will pour out my spirit. So here's been my prayers. I'm asking God to revive my heart. God, pour out your spirit on me. God, God, I want to sense the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I want to sense the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. I want to know that you're here with me, not just intellectually, but I want to know you're here with me. And the last thing is this. Leave the results up to him. Trust the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding. Here's just a couple of questions and I'm going to pray. How real is the Holy Spirit to you? Is he just this this concept that you know about? Or do you have a relationship with him? How frequent is your communication with him? Are you experiencing his power in your life? And are you ministering, living, using the gifts he has given to you? Those are great reflective questions let me pray and if anybody has any questions i'll stay as long as you want and answer the questions so next week we're going to talk about the gifts of the spirit all right and so some of them are a little bit more polemic than others but we're going to talk about the gifts of the spirit next week all right let's pray together lord lord thank you so much that because of the new covenant because of what jesus did for us We don't have to offer any more sacrifices. It's done. Thank you that our sins are forgiven. We're acquitted 
we're guilt free. We can enter into your presence anytime we want. And we've been given the Holy Spirit of God. Forgive us of ignoring him. Forgive us of being dependent or being independent of him and create within us a longing, a desire, a passion to submit ourselves to him and to be filled, to be controlled. Lord, for you to anoint us and to empower us and to use us much more powerfully than we can ever be used ourselves on our own. Lord, help us to experience that in our lives and our ministry. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.